I received a message notification, saying my wife had reserved a table at a restaurant for Valentine's Day. I thought it was the most unexpected thing. Considering I usually take care of these things every year, however, by the evening, all I received was a message saying she had to work overtime, not long after. I stumbled upon a post from her junior on WeChat. Only a caring sister knows how to spoil someone. A fancy restaurant. A sweet person. Tonight's cake was sweet. But not as sweet as your lips. The picture showed him and Evelyn in an intimate pose. And around her neck was the necklace I gave her this morning. On the table was the wine I gifted her. In the past. I might have furiously confronted Evelyn. But this time. I was just exhausted. Chapter 1. When Evelyn came home. I was eating a mango. She's allergic to mangoes, just a touch would cause her skin to break out in hives. So, for many years, we haven't even had mango-flavored ice cream in our house. Evelyn looked surprised to see me still awake. Casually, she handed me the gift she had prepared. In a flat tone, she said, Happy Valentine's Day. Honey, to be fair, she's a good wife. She doesn't just take, but also puts effort into preparing gifts for me in advance. For example, this expensive Patek Philippe watch I just received. This year. I got a message from the restaurant owner on Valentine's Day. Saying Evelyn had reserved a table. The owner has known us since college and witnessed our love story. So he's kind of a friend. I confessed and proposed to Evelyn at his restaurant. He joked over the phone. Calling himself a single guy while congratulating us. Then asked if I wanted to try their new cake tonight. I asked. Does the cake have mango in it? If so. Let's stick to the usual. Thanks. But my wife's allergic to mango. Just after I hung up with him. Evelyn called. I have to work overtime tonight. I won't be able to spend the evening with you. That night, I couldn't sleep. So I scrolled through my phone. I saw a post from her junior. Peter. Only a caring sister knows how to spoil someone. A fancy restaurant. A sweet person. Tonight's cake was sweet, but not as sweet as your lips. The picture showed him and Evelyn in an intimate pose. His hand loosely wrapped around her waist. His smile gentle and suggestive. On the table was the wine I had given Evelyn. And around her neck was the necklace I'd given her that morning. I instantly recognized the restaurant, the one that holds so much meaning for Evelyn and me. Peter was holding the dessert the owner had recommended. The cake had layers filled with mango puree. Chapter 2. When Evelyn sat down to eat with me, she frowned and said, Why is there mango? I had seen Peter's post. I knew he was provoking me on purpose, but I was too tired. I didn't want to question Evelyn or argue with her anymore. I stared at my phone screen and suddenly had a strong craving for mango. I ordered a delivery. And soon fresh cut mango was in my hands. It tasted sweet with a hint of tartness. A perfect balance. I've always loved eating it. But since being with Evelyn, I hadn't had any. After I finished, I wiped my hands and said. I'm going to bed now if there's nothing else. Evelyn grabbed my arm and said. Oliver. It's Valentine's Day. I looked at her in confusion and asked. So what? Her frown deepened as she stood up. Moving closer to me. In a teasing voice. She whispered in my ear. On a night like this. Are you really going to bed so early? Evelyn has always had a cold, distant allure. After graduation, once she put on glasses, her intellectual charm only heightened that sense of distance. But tonight, I could smell a faint scent of smoke on her. I took a step back, avoiding her kiss. I said, I just ate mango. You'll have an allergic reaction. Chapter 3. I ignored Evelyn's astonished expression and walked into the bedroom, locking the door behind me with a click, lying in bed. My phone rang, it was my supervisor. She asked. Have you really decided to take the position? If you flake on me again because of Evelyn, I swear I'll kill you. I'm not joking. I chuckled and replied. I won't back out again. If I do, I'll personally come to you. Head in hand. The position in the company's advertising department offers a higher salary, but it requires constant travel for business. Three years ago, my supervisor had wanted me to take the role, but I refused because of Evelyn. Evelyn and I have known each other for more than 10 years. We grew up together. I've always known she's a traditional woman who cares about details and boundaries, being away all the time, maybe only seeing her for 30 days a year, and not even knowing when we'd see each other, that kind of instability, she couldn't handle it, I once had her take the MBTI test, she didn't really get why, but she did it and showed me the result, ISTJ, keywords, reserved, traditional, serious, self-disciplined, orderly, that's exactly who Evelyn is, just holding her hand took me over half a year, in middle and high school, my close friends thought someone like her was incredibly boring. They didn't understand why I liked her. I smiled and told them. Because she saved my life, literally. Back in middle school, an earthquake affected our school. We were in class, and everyone rushed outside in a panic. I charged ahead, but hit a desk leg hard and fell. She pushed through the crowd, fighting against the current to find me. 
She made sure I walked in front of her, and followed closely behind as we ran out together. Later, I asked her, What were you thinking? If you died, wouldn't all your dreams and hard work be for nothing? Evelyn was a bit stunned by my question. She said, I wasn't thinking that much. At that moment, I just thought that if I couldn't make it, I'd rather die with you. That Evelyn, she probably never imagined that. One day, she'd leave me behind for someone else. I've never doubted her sincerity. But sincerity is fleeting. My supervisor must have picked up on something between Evelyn and me for my tone. She said, who hasn't made mistakes in this world? It's easier to blame past mistakes than to fix them. Oliver, I hope you always have the courage to turn the tables when necessary. She added one last thing. Of course, someone as perfect as me never makes mistakes. You, on the other hand, aren't as perfect as I am. So it's understandable. But no matter what, even if you lose the woman, you can't lose the job. You start in three days, and you've got a business trip to Argentina right away. You can't be half-hearted about this. Chapter 4 the next day, I woke up early to go to the office and hand over my current work. Evelyn was sitting in the living room, her lips slightly swollen, a sign of her mango allergy. It was probably from Peter kissing her after eating the mango cake last night. I walked past her, heading for the door. But she grabbed my wrist, she frowned, looking a little defiant, and asked, Why are you mad? Is it because I didn't spend time with you yesterday? I already told you I was busy and had to work overtime. I even let you know I'd be home late. The company is going public. As a woman, do you have any idea how hard it's been for me to climb my way to management? So many eyes are on me. How could I not set an example? You've always said you'd support me in having my own career. Why are you acting like this now? Yeah, this is how it's always been. I love her. So I tolerate her. Even when she was so busy that she didn't know I was in the hospital, and I couldn't reach her by phone, I never said a word. Until one day, I picked her up from work, and her phone rang, while she was doing her eyebrows. She immediately put down her half-finished makeup and sweetly answered someone else's call. That was the first time I heard her mention Peter's name. It was also the first time I realized that she wasn't too busy to take a phone call. And she wasn't the reserved, distant woman who kept boundaries with men. It was just that I wasn't the person she thought was worth her showing those feelings. I pulled my hand away from Evelyn and calmly said, That's enough, Evelyn. We're done. Before I could finish, her phone suddenly rang. She glanced at the screen and gave me an apologetic look. Peter's boyish voice came through the phone. Sis, come pick me up. It's so cold today. I don't want to get out of bed. If you don't come get me, you can't dock my pay if I'm late. Evelyn's expression softened almost unconsciously. She said. You, afraid of the cold, the same guy who climbs snowy mountains at night. All right, Peter, get up. You're bringing me breakfast today, remember? I let out a sarcastic laugh. On the other end, Peter seemed to sense something. Oh right, tell Ning thanks from me. Yesterday. I not only ate at his restaurant, but borrowed one of his people too. I'll definitely work hard and send him a great gift in the future. Chapter 5 Evelyn gave me a guilty glance when she heard Peter's words, then quickly looked away. Her fingers instinctively pressed the volume down button on her phone. You really can't help but laugh when things get to this point. I shook my head and turned to leave, but I heard Evelyn quickly reject Peter and catch up to me. Yesterday, Peter had a client dinner, but he forgot to book a restaurant. So I gave him our reservation, it was all for business. You understand, right? I stared at her in silence, spending Valentine's Day with a client, did she not find that absurd? Evelyn probably didn't realize it. Whenever she lies or gets nervous, she unconsciously grips her wedding ring, but it didn't take long before Peter called her again. And she left, citing food poisoning or some other excuse, it didn't matter. It wasn't the first time, this winter was unusually cold, snow blocked the roads, and there was no delivery available. I wanted Evelyn to make me some porridge, but I saw her put on her coat and get up, saying, Peter has no food at home. I'm going to his place to cook something for him. I froze in place. I wasn't sure whether to ask what her relationship with Peter was, or why she needed to cook for another man. But Evelyn didn't give me the chance to ask. She hurried out the door, without even noticing that I was curled up on the couch, feeling unwell. It was so different from when we were in high school. Back then, if I even showed the slightest sign of stress, skipping meals, she would scold me coldly, but during an emergency break, she'd somehow pull out a steaming hot bowl of rice cakes like magic. Eat up. You'll only get worse if I don't take care of you. You're always causing me trouble. When I got to the office, my supervisor dumped a mountain of paperwork on my desk. Handle all of this within three days, or come to me with your head. I worked late into the night, and when I checked my phone, I saw a draft of the divorce paper sent by the lawyer. So, in the middle of the snowstorm, I took a cab straight to Evelyn's office building. But when I reached her floor, the power went out. 
I frowned and turned on my phone's flashlight. At that moment, I got a message from a colleague with a link. His tone was hesitant. Isn't this the heavy metal band concert you've always wanted to go to? Confused, I clicked the link. It took me to the poster's homepage. It was Peter's account. It chronicled all his moments with Evelyn. Turns out he had known Evelyn since high school, followed her to college, and now worked at her company. His bio read, being head over heels for her isn't just your privilege. I clicked on the video, and suddenly understood why my colleague had been so hesitant. In the video, concert lights flashed over Peter and Evelyn's faces. They were holding hands and kissing passionately in the crowd. My phone slipped from my hand and crashed to the ground. Rage filled my chest. Evelyn and I had been together for most of our lives. We'd practically spent our entire existence together. But despite all that, I still found Evelyn so unfamiliar. It felt like I'd never really known her at all. From her office came the sound of soft sobs. Evelyn choked out. I'm sorry, but we really can't. A male voice responded. I just. I just like you. What did I do wrong? The boy wrapped his arms around her waist, gently stroking her tear-streaked face. Peter kissed Evelyn's tear-stained cheek, sadness filling his eyes. I watched as his hand slid up from her waist, until it rested on the back of her head. And then, in the darkness, they shared a long, lingering kiss. Bang. The power came back on. And the lights flooded the room. Ah. They finally noticed me standing at the door. Peter said. Ning. It's not what it looks like. I'm just too in love with her. It's not Evelyn's fault. Evelyn looked like she was in a daze when she saw me. Her lips were slightly parted, still glistening with moisture. Oliver, why are you here? I looked at her calmly, then walked over to Peter with a smile. But in the next second, I slammed my fist into his face. Before he could even fall, I grabbed him by the collar, pulling him closer, and glared at him viciously. This punch is for your pathetic face. I've met a lot of female, pretentious coquettes, but I've never met a male one until now. Makes me sick. He opened his mouth to argue. But in an instant, I threw a right hook into his stomach, the force driving through him, making him double over in pain and collapse. Evelyn snapped out of it, just about to speak. Smack. I backhanded her across the face. She clutched her cheek, her eyes filling with tears, looking hurt. I coldly removed my wedding ring, tossing it at her like trash. When it hit her, she finally began to sob, worthless tears streaming down her swollen cheeks. Her voice rose. Oliver, don't do this, please. Just listen to me. But I cut her off. Handing her the printed divorce papers, I said. Evelyn, we're getting a divorce. Chapter 6. Evelyn, disregarding all dignity, chased me all the way downstairs from the office. Oliver, please listen to me, it's not what you think. Half the building was watching. Embarrassed, I flagged down a cab, ready to leave. Amid the falling snow, Evelyn pressed against the car door, not letting me close it. Her expression was almost pleading as she said, there's really nothing between us. He's just a kid. He doesn't know any better. I was only. I sneered. He's not grown up yet. So you're just teaching him how to kiss in advance. Huh? My tone was flat. She looked at me. Her eyes red. As if staring at a ship that was never coming back. She choked out. Don't look at me like that. Oliver. Please. Don't look at me like that. We've been together for over 10 years. I can't live without you. Peter. Peter was just an accident. Her voice grew quieter and quieter. But then someone called out from behind her. Evelyn, Peter's gone up to the rooftop, come quick. She instinctively let go and turned around. I let out a derisive laugh and slammed the car door shut without hesitation. In the rearview mirror, I saw Evelyn take a few steps after me, but she stopped, turning back to run into the building. I closed my eyes. Once the anger subsided, the stabbing pain in my chest finally hit me. The driver glanced at me through the rearview mirror, his voice full of concern. Hey, kid, you alright? I wiped my face, turning my head away. I remained silent. Back home. I started packing up my belongings. Not long after, both Evelyn's parents and my parents called me. I thought bitterly. Evelyn sure is busy. She has to calm Peter down from jumping off a building. But she still has time to inform both sets of parents to play peacemakers. Evelyn and I have been together for over 10 years. Our entanglement is deeper and harder to break than most couples. In the end, all my parents said to me was. Son, we just hope that every decision you make is for your own happiness. I finally finished packing all my things. I opened the door, only to be met with Evelyn's devastated face. Chapter 7. Evelyn looked dejected, like a child caught doing something wrong. She trembled as she reached out to hold my hand. Oliver, don't go. Please don't leave. I can explain everything. I stared at her calmly. Suddenly, she broke down. I'm begging you. Hit me. Scold me. Do whatever you want. Just don't look at me like that. Don't look at me like that. She pressed down on my suitcase, trying to keep me from leaving. Oliver, 
We promise to grow old together. Our parents are expecting us to go back to Beijing for the new year this year. You can't leave me now. Mom and Dad miss you so much. I sighed and asked. What do you want? Evelyn. She nearly collapsed to her knees. Hugging my leg. Her tears soaking through my clothes. Sobbing uncontrollably. She pleaded. Please. Give me another chance. I promise. I'll do better. I didn't respond. My eyes. However. Fell on the old college graduation photo that had accidentally fallen out while I was packing. That's when I noticed. In that picture. It wasn't just Evelyn and me. Peter was there too. Standing in the distance under the shade of a tree. Staring at Evelyn. And Evelyn's gaze wasn't on me. It had passed over me. Meeting his. So it had started that early. Hadn't it? I had thought those moments belonged only to Evelyn and me. But there had always been a third person in the background. Evelyn trembled slightly. Unable to lift her head to meet my gaze. Like a criminal awaiting a death sentence. To her surprise. I softly said. All right. She looked up at me in disbelief. Her eyes lighting up with hope. Really, Oliver, are you really willing to start over with me? After thinking for a moment, I nodded and unexpectedly said. Sure, on one condition. Remember how we planned to take a trip to the islands back in high school? All these years, we never made it. I want us to take a five-day vacation to the islands. How about that? Evelyn immediately agreed. She threw herself into my arms, murmuring. It's that simple. Yeah, it's that simple. But I knew she wouldn't be able to do it. Chapter 8 when I thought about it carefully, Evelyn being attracted to Peter wasn't all that surprising. Evelyn had spent her entire life following her family's rules, living cautiously, from Beijing to the capital, from her education to marriage, and even having a childhood sweetheart as her husband. Her future was like a peaceful, well-paved road laid out in advance. But when life is too calm for too long, it's inevitable to crave excitement. Peter was like a cold soda on a scorching summer day. He was rebellious, adventurous. He'd take her on night hikes up snow-covered mountains, stay up all night at concerts, kiss her at sunrise by the sea, no matter how reserved someone is. It's hard not to be swept up in such an intense, passionate pursuit. Evelyn said that after our vacation, she would stick by my side every day and wouldn't let me get tired of her. It was as if she was afraid I might change my mind, so she watched me closely at all times. Usually, I'd be the one planning our vacations, but this time was different. Evelyn took charge eagerly organizing every detail of our trip to the islands. It seemed like she was genuinely excited about finally taking the trip we'd never had. Meanwhile, I scrolled through social media, bored. Peter would post something every day, practically torturing himself as he dissected his feelings for Evelyn. I lowered my eyes and watched coldly. Today, he couldn't hold back any longer and posted something completely unfiltered. The person she loves is me. I couldn't help but laugh. I posted something in response. From now on, I'll be living on the islands with my wife. The past is like yesterday. Dead and gone. Today is a new beginning. The past is smoke. I just want to hold your hand from now on. Peter finally couldn't contain himself and asked to meet with me. In the cafe, he gritted his teeth and asked. After everything, you're still going to forgive her. You're really going to stay with her. I smiled but said nothing. He angrily spat out. You're really leaving. Really moving to the islands. Why hasn't she said anything to me? I threw the visa my supervisor had expedited for me onto the table in front of him. Half joking, I said. Evelyn and I have been together for over 10 years. She begged me to give her another chance. I told her if she could drop everything and leave with me, I'd forgive her. Of course, she gratefully agreed. I smiled. But there was no warmth in my eyes. Peter, furious, said. That's impossible. I've done so much for her. She told me she loves me. He was seething with anger. But beneath it, I could still hear the pain in his voice. I stared at him coldly. Peter really knew how to hit where it hurt. He stole Evelyn away on Valentine's Day. Messaged me to reveal their relationship. And even let me catch them kissing. All to make me give up on Evelyn and leave her. But he didn't realize that my place in Evelyn's heart was far deeper than he thought. His schemes had all backfired on him. Peter, enraged, lunged at me. But what threat could a little guy like him pose? I easily blocked him. Poured my coffee over his head. Then, without giving him time to react. Slapped him hard enough to knock him to the ground. I crouched down, grabbed his hair, and forced him to look up, smiling. I said. Pathetic. You're really serious about loving Evelyn. Huh? Too bad for you. You didn't really think. She loves you, did you? Looking at his face, full of frustration and resentment. I had to fight the urge to vomit. I emphasized once more that if Evelyn really left with me, I'd forgive her, and we'd live happily together. But if she didn't go, I'd never forgive her. Peter's expression kept changing. I smiled knowing he understood. Chapter 9. At the airport. Evelyn anxiously checked her phone, her lips tightly pursed. Oliver. This time is different. Peter was in a car accident. 
and it's really serious. Can we postpone the trip to the islands? Peter was certainly willing to go all out. I silently stared at her, my eyes tracing every contour of her face. Suddenly, I said, I know why you didn't come to that concert with me that night. Evelyn froze, her lips twitching slightly as if trying to force a smile, but failing, she said, that night, it was Peter's birthday, he invited me, I couldn't turn him down, I laughed, that was my favorite band since I was a teenager, on my birthday that year, you kept pestering me, asking what my wish was, I told you I hoped to make enough money to see them live, you got mad and asked why my wish didn't involve taking you with me, so I paused and continued, my birthday wish at 18 was to see their concert with you, don't you remember, I was at that concert that night, I just didn't know, that my wife was in the crowd, kissing someone else, I even sent her a message during the concert, reminding her to eat something, it disappeared into the void. Without a single response, Evelyn began to panic, her voice rose, as if trying to make up for something. There will be other chances, I cut her off, there won't be, that was their farewell concert, there won't be another one, I looked her in the eyes and repeated. There won't be another one, we stood there in silence for a moment, then I suddenly relaxed, waving her off, go ahead, he's been in an accident and you're his supervisor, it'd look bad if you didn't go, as for the islands, I smiled, meeting her gaze, it was like I could see the girl who, at 18, pouted and insisted I take her to the islands one day, I continued, we'll just go next time, Evelyn looked like she had been granted a reprieve, she rushed out of the airport, braving the snow and rain to catch a cab to Peter's side, I tore up the plane ticket in my hand and threw the pieces in the trash, then I printed a new ticket, destination, Argentina, chapter 10, when Evelyn woke up, she found herself lying in a man's arms, the man was gently kissing her face, something didn't feel right, she widened her eyes, this wasn't Oliver, yesterday, she had rushed to the hospital, only to find that Peter's car accident was just a lie, she had been angry at first, but then he tearfully said, Evelyn, I've loved you for so many years, one last time, can't you just stay with me one last time, a voice inside her head kept pulling her to leave, Oliver, Oliver must be furious by now, they'd known each other since childhood, Growing up together, they had been married for seven years, everything had been so perfect, she couldn't leave Oliver, but Peter, his eyes red-rimmed, gently stroked her cheek, how could she turn him away, when he looked at her with such devotion, Evelyn suddenly felt a sinking feeling in her heart, it was like a premonition, when you're about to lose something important, there's always an almost instinctive sense of dread, like the feeling of falling in a dream from a tall building in the middle of the night, without reason. She suddenly thought of Oliver's expression when he waved to her at the airport yesterday. Nostalgic, yet resolute. It was as if he was saying goodbye. She nearly jumped out of bed to grab her phone. Peter asked in confusion, Evelyn, what's wrong? But her phone was dead. Her heart pounded as she anxiously watched the black screen, waiting for it to charge, as if she could burn a hole into it with her stare. Her panic-stricken expression startled Peter. Finally, the phone powered back on. As soon as it did, a call came in and the voice on the other end was shouting. Evelyn was stunned. It was her mother yelling at her. It took Evelyn a while to understand what was happening. Apparently, Oliver had compiled evidence of her affair with Peter into a PowerPoint presentation, complete with a 320 megabytes attachment, and sent it to all of their family, friends, and colleagues. The final slide had Oliver's typical touch, a photoshopped picture of her and Peter's wedding, with a handwritten note that read, let's wish this pair of cheaters a lifetime of childless, everlasting happiness. After hanging up, she opened her messages. She saw that Oliver had only left her a picture of the divorce papers. With a single note, on the desk in the study, sign it and send it to my office. Chapter 11. She drove like a madwoman, running red lights all the way home. This winter was exceptionally cold, and rain and snow had turned the roads slick. She skidded several times, nearly crashing. The driver of a car she almost hit rolled down their window to yell at her, despite the weather. But it was as if she was in a daze, unable to hear anything. All she could think about was getting home, finding Oliver. He was so soft-hearted. He loved her so much. There had to be a chance to fix this. There wasn't time to wait. Oliver had to be furious by now. But when she finally got home, she found the house empty. Oliver had packed up almost everything he owned and taken it with him. She remembered how, when they were preparing for the island trip, she had teased him about packing so much. She had joked, it's not like we're never coming back. Oliver had only smiled and said nothing in return. Her heart filled with a dull suffocating pain, so that was it, he had been planning to leave her all along, no, that couldn't be, they had been together for most of their lives, practically their entire existence, she couldn't live without Oliver, Oliver couldn't live without her either, if she just, if she apologized sincerely, made things right, he would forgive her, just like he always did, after all, 
He'd once said they were meant to be together since childhood, but when she reached Oliver's office, his cold-faced supervisor ordered security to throw her out. When she finally managed to contact one of Oliver's colleagues, even they treated her with disdain. She spent days trying to track him down, only to learn that Oliver had taken the new position. He was now traveling for work, flying from one place to another, with no known return date. How ridiculous. His wife had to go to such lengths just to learn a little about his whereabouts. Evelyn slowly realized. It seemed like Oliver had been leaving her little by little for some time now. Her message thread with him no longer had those playful emoji-filled chats. Now, every message she sent him returned with a red exclamation mark. She looked at his social media, and all traces of their relationship had been erased. The only thing left was a reposted quote. When did you decide to break up? When you realized that your future would be as long and suffocating as every day is now. I just want to live happily. Chapter 12. After finishing business. I set aside some time to explore Argentina. This country, 22,000 kilometers from home, was in the middle of summer. The sun bathed the land, casting a golden veil over everything. In the streets of Buenos Aires, tango dancers twirled in the sunset, and the air was filled with a mix of European elegance and Latin American passion. At the invitation of a business partner, I traveled to Mendoza. The vineyards thrived under the summer sun, stretching out like a vast green sea of vines, basking in this sunlight. It felt like the cold winter had been completely driven away. As I sipped a glass of Malbec wine, Evelyn's call came through. Her voice was hoarse as she asked, Oliver, where are you? I took a sip of the wine and thought about where Argentina was on the map. I replied, on the other side of the world, what do you want? If you've signed the divorce papers, send them to my office. If not, don't bother calling. Evelyn was silent, as I was about to hang up. She suddenly said, I'm sorry. It was as if a floodgate had opened and her sobs crossed oceans to reach me. Her voice was filled with helplessness and pain, like a child abandoned in a crowded store. Oliver, I'm sorry. Please, forgive me. Tell me what to do, and I'll do anything you say. Twenty years. We've been together for over twenty years. Can you really just let it go? How can you be so heartless? I smiled to myself. She must have heard my laugh, because she suddenly froze. Her sobbing stopped. In a panic, she asked, Oliver, why are you laughing? I exhaled, looking down, and said, You're always like this, Evelyn, you're always like this, you're so sure that I love you, so sure that if you just show me your pain, act pathetic, I'll feel sorry for you, but, Evelyn, have you ever thought, I don't love you anymore? Chapter 13 The next time I returned to my home in Beijing, it was New Year's Eve, the problem with childhood sweethearts is that they know each other too well, as the family gathered for the festive reunion dinner, there was a knock at the door. I opened it to find a haggard-looking Evelyn standing there. She looked even thinner than before, her hair unkempt, hanging loosely over a pilled beige sweater. She looked desolate and helpless. The PowerPoint I made had completely destroyed her and Peter's reputation within their social circles. Maybe there was some justice in that. Ever since, Evelyn had been on a downward spiral. People who once supported her, seeing her true character, shook their heads and withdrew their help. That was just part of the gossip I had overheard at dinner. As for me. I hadn't spoken to her since that last phone call. The streets were filled with the warm glow of homes, and fireworks lit up the sky in the distance. Evelyn looked at me, her face filled with despair, but there was still a glimmer of hope in her eyes. She spoke with difficulty. Every year, we've always spent New Year's Eve together. Oliver, I love you. I really can't live without you. I looked at her, and suddenly, I remembered the younger version of her sneaking out on New Year's Eve. Cheeks flushed, just to give me a red string bracelet she had woven herself. I had thought that seeing her again would hurt, but to my surprise, I felt nothing at all. These past months, flying all over the world, the different landscapes I'd seen had slowly but surely filled my heart. The sound of fireworks marked the end of the year. The long, cold winter was finally over. A new year was about to begin. I said, Evelyn, don't do this. It's New Year's, seeing you like this makes me feel sick. Evelyn's face turned deathly pale. I closed the door. When my parents asked who it was, I just shook my head and said, no one. Then I dove back into the warmth of the family dinner, fighting for the last piece of beef in the hot pot. Laughter filled the room, and everyone was in high spirits. It was wonderful. I still had my family. Chapter 14. Under the so-called brilliant leadership of my supervisor, my career was thriving. I quickly adapted to the life of constant travel. Whenever I arrived in a new place, I'd send a postcard back home. My mom, having picked up some internet slang, now called me her travel frog. This time, I was in Japan. My mom worried over the phone, son, be careful, I've heard Japan has a lot of earthquakes. I took a big bite of the mango bread I had just bought. Walking toward the fireworks festival, 
Japan truly was a fascinating country, having once modeled itself after much of our culture. Yet now it had developed its own distinct, melancholic, and quietly romantic essence. Under the canopy of a summer night, the Japanese fireworks festival was like a dazzling dream. The fireworks exploded in the night sky, like countless shining stars burning brightly for a moment. Turning the darkness into day, I looked up, momentarily forgetting to breathe, snapping out of it. I smiled and said to my mom over the phone, Earthquakes aren't that common, but, as luck would have it, Japan's meteorological agency issued an unprecedented warning. Nankai Trough Earthquake, Temporary Information, Attention to Large Earthquake. All flights back were fully booked. By the time the news reached home, I had gone off the grid. My mom was so frantic she started praying to gods. Even lighting incense at midnight to ask for my safety. Evelyn heard the news and silently booked a flight to Japan. Peter was still by her side at the time. He had lost his job and been blacklisted in the industry. He and Evelyn were locked in a toxic relationship, torturing each other. He said. Don't be stupid. Even if you go, Oliver won't forgive you. Don't you understand? But Evelyn refused to listen to him. In their struggle, unable to break free, Evelyn grabbed a kettle from the table and smashed it over Peter's head. Blood poured from Peter's forehead. He screamed like a madman. He doesn't love you. Don't you get it? He never loved you. I'm the only one who loves you, Evelyn. I'm the only one who loves you. But all Evelyn left him with was her back. Chapter 15. Thankfully, I made it back to the country without any major incidents. Though my return flight had been delayed, before the plane took off, my broken phone strangely received a call from an unknown number. But with the flight attendants urging me to switch it off, I hung up and shut it down. Once I got home, I reassured my family that I was safe and went straight to work. That strange call slipped my mind, until Peter showed up outside my office building. He was no longer the proud, confident man he once was. He stood there, red-eyed and disheveled, demanding. Where's Evelyn? Give me back my Evelyn. Through the glass door, I frowned and looked at him like he was a madman. It turned out Evelyn had gone to Japan. Just before the earthquake, suddenly, it clicked, and I remembered that strange call. But I kept my expression calm and had security remove Peter. I told him. I don't care. She's your girlfriend now, not mine. The bad news came from Evelyn's parents, who told my parents, and eventually reached me. Evelyn had followed the address from my last social media post, where I'd mentioned watching the fireworks festival, like carving a mark into a boat to find a lost sword. She was searching for me, calling. Oliver, Oliver, using a new SIM card to try and reach me, but all she got was a busy signal. She thought I was still angry and ignoring her calls, so she chased me down to the inn where I had stayed. That's when the building collapsed. My mother sighed heavily as she told me the story. Sigh. I couldn't help but remember the girl who had shielded me during the earthquake in middle school, helping me escape the collapsing classroom. A mix of emotions stirred within me. This time, Evelyn hadn't made it out. She had been crushed. Her leg shattered. Whether she'd ever walk again was uncertain. Over the phone, my mom cautiously asked. Son, are you going to visit her? I shook my head. When there was no response, I realized she couldn't see me. So I said. No. Evelyn and I, we have nothing to do with each other anymore. Chapter 16. After hanging up the phone, I looked out the window. This was another new and unfamiliar country. What beautiful sights would I find here? I was looking forward to it. As for the past. The events of yesterday die with yesterday. The events of today are born anew. I hope everyone finds the courage to flip the table and start over.